Okay, welcome to the SCR Connections September 2019 webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us. It is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Melody Herr. She is the head of the Office of Scholarly Communications at the University of Arkansas, and she has a joint appointment with the University Libraries and the Office of Research and Innovation. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and pass her, to, uh, pass her the ball and let her take over. Thank you, Brian, and welcome everyone for join to huh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar. As Brian said, I am Melody Her, and because of my joint appointment here at the University of Arkansas, I work with librarians, research administrators, and researchers themselves on a daily basis. This morning, I want to share what I've learned about research misconduct, both from extensive reading and from unfortunate personal experience. Research is really important because when it is, mis when it is prevalent, it can undermine the foundation of science, which is trust in the integrity of researchers and research results. So whenever we support or participate in research, we share responsibility for promoting integrity with all the other individuals involved in the project. So in this webinar, I want to provide an introduction. First, it's important to understand what misconduct is and why we should take it seriously. I define misconduct, discuss its causes, and note its consequences. Then. I want to empower you with a set of strategies for responding effectively when you suspect or detect misconduct. Finally, I suggest ways in which both we as individuals and our professional communities can prepare to promote research integrity. Now please understand, I'm not proposing that we pin on badges and appoint ourselves research police. Rather, I want us to embrace the opportunity and the responsibility to act as re agents of integrity. So although this is a virtual presentation, I wanted to provide an interactive element. So I'm using the program known as Mentimeter. If you've not used this before, whoops. Okay. The way this works is, Use your phone or open another screen on your computer so you can log into a website. Go to menti.com and then enter this code. That will allow you then, again, the code is 209225. Then you'll be able to respond to this question, in what ways do you currently support or participate in research? If you want to provide just a few words for an answer, we'll be able to see your responses pop up in a word cloud. I'll give you a few minutes to log in and do that. Great, we're getting some responses already. See why I love this program. Excellent, I'm so glad most of you are participating. So what I'm seeing is literature search, literature research, a graduate student. Not sure. I'm hoping one of you is a graduate student. Oh no. Am I still connected? Workshops, filters, author services, medicine, choosing a journal. So as you can see here, we are moving beyond our traditional roles as librarians and as research administrators. I'm a little surprised to see that there weren't more individuals who talked about 
um, data management because this is one of the things that the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine considers very important. Indeed, the National Academy says that research data management is fundamental to research integrity. So let's begin at looking at the potential for misconduct and the shared responsibility for promoting integrity. Everyone can cite headline misconduct cases, such as the one at Duke in early 2019, but not all incidents merit such notoriety. Of course, it's impossible to determine precisely the incidents of misconduct. Evidence from documented cases, self-reporting surveys, and article retractions suggest that while it is unusual, it is not rare, and there are indications that misconduct is on the rise. Because of the astronomical costs of research, even a few cases may waste millions of dollars. In 2017, the National Academies calculated that a total of several hundred million dollars a year would be a reasonable conservative estimate of the direct financial costs of research misconduct. However, as this graphic shows, misconduct has many non-financial costs, and it may imperil the welfare of individuals and society. So I really love this graphic because it highlights not only the expense in terms of finances, but the lost years of training and work, the advancement of science is impaired, and science as an institution loses public trust. Indeed, we all know that public trust, once damaged, does not recover easily. So how does misconduct come to light? The means of detecting misconduct run from sophisticated algorithms to peer scrutiny. Technical methods include plagiarism detection software, strategies for identifying manipulated images, and statistical analysis of research data. Peer reviewers evaluate manuscripts before publication. Self-appointed watchdogs examine published research. But the primary tools for detection are the alert eyes and ears the acute minds, and the honorable hearts of people like you and me. Studies have shown that collaborators and colleagues are often the ones who bring misconduct to light. Why? Because these individuals, just like us, understand science best and live with the research day to day. They, like us, are in the position to notice when something seems awry. Along with all research members, we share the responsibility for promoting research integrity. Again, I need to repeat that we shouldn't run around and appoint ourselves research police. Rather, I want us to embrace the opportunity and the responsibility to act as agents of integrity. Along with all members of a research team, we share the responsibility to be aware of the potential for misconduct and to respond when we spot it or suspect it. The National Academies demands vigilance, professionalism, and collegiality in the pursuit of research integrity. Here, I'm emphasizing vigilance. In a few minutes, I'll say more about professionalism and collegiality. But first, let's talk about the causes of misconduct and the ways in which it is defined. Cheating takes place in classrooms, on soccer fields, and in corporate headquarters. These diverse contexts have common traits, and social scientists agree that situational factors, not character flaws, determine the probability that a person will cheat. These factors include the degree of competitive pressure, the perceived fairness of the system, the potential rewards for cheating, and the seemingly low probability of success through legitimate means. Okay, so. Well, this slide was working a few minutes ago. So we're going to skip the interactive activity for that slide and point out that these variables, competition, fairness, the rewards of cheating, and the probability of success prevail in today's hyper-competitive research environment. Indeed, the National Academies acknowledges that this environment contributes to research misconduct. I love this 
this photograph because it really does show a hyper-competitive environment. In addition, quantitative performance metrics like publications, patents, research dollars, and doctoral graduates give researchers what is known as perverse incentives to compromise integrity. But there are some other common causes of misconduct. And here, it is important to note that a researcher may, con may commit misconduct unintentionally. James M. Du Bois and his colleagues designed the Professionalism and Integrity in Research program, popularly known as the PI program, at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis to retrain individuals who've been charged with misconduct or violations of regulations or ethical standards. Du Bois' team discovered that such violations frequently result from a lack of attention to detail, uncertainty about rules and regulations, and the failure to prioritize compliance, understaffing, inadequately trained or supervised staff, and a general lack of resources, as well as the principal investigator's own lack of communication, decision-making, and management skills, particularly the attempt to manage too many projects at once, all work against research integrity. So on this slide, I've summarized the factors that Du Bois' team identified, lack of resources, lack of information, and the lack of management skills. But what counts as research misconduct? Let's examine a few definitions. There are actually three sources of definitions, and you'll want to be familiar with all of the ones that apply to your situation. There is federal law, institutional policy, and disciplinary practice. In the United States, federal law defines research misconduct for funding agencies. These laws apply to all researchers who receive federal funding. For the National Science Foundation, Title 45 of the Code of Federal Reg Regulations, Part 689, recognizes three categories of misconduct. Fabrication, which means making up data or results. Falsification, which means manipulating research materials, equipment, or processes or changing or omitting data or results. And plagiarism, which means the appropriation of another person's ideas, processes, results, or words without giving appropriate credit. Now, you want to keep in mind that the law specifies honest errors and differences of opinion do not constitute misconduct. The US Department of Health and Human Services which oversees the NIH, employs an identical definition of misconduct. These federal laws lay out the procedures for handling allegations, the criteria for determining if misconduct has occurred, and the penalties which may be imposed. Whereas government funding agencies provide oversight, they delegate primary responsibility for preventing, detecting, and responding to misconduct to the awardee institutions, that is, the institutions which receive funding or which host funding recipients. So now let's look at institutional definitions. At a minimum, institutions must apply this tripart definition of misconduct, fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism, although they may extend it to encompass other forms of deviance, such as theft and regulatory violations. If you've been paying attention to the news in the research community, there's also talk about making bullying and sexual harassment part of the definition of research misconduct. So you will want to familiarize yourself with your institution's policy. Typically, it can be found on the Office of Research website, such as the one here at Harvard. Along with institutional policies, you'll want to learn about the ethics and best practices of the disciplines which you serve. An association usually posts its code of conduct on its website, such as the American Chemical Society has done here. And here's one more resource I want to share with you. The Center for the Study of Ethics and the Professions at the Illinois Institute of Technology hosts the Ethics Codes Collection. Here, you can run a search by discipline or keyword 
and you'll get links to multiple national and international organizations. But now we come to my favorite part, the strategies. When you suspect or detect misconduct, reporting directly to authorities may be necessary if it poses an immediate threat to research subjects, the environment, or human welfare. Likewise, formal allegations may be the only effective measure if suspected persons prove recalcitrant. Yet, in many cases, you can successfully address misconduct behind the scenes. I'm going to show you a set of strategies based on a program for the promotion of ethical behavior in business and enhanced with recommendations from the research community. These strategies escalate through three stages, gathering facts and asking questions, engaging in conversation, and presenting allegations to your institution's administration. At each stage, success or satisfaction may prevent the need for subsequent action. For example, if additional information alleviates concerns about misconduct, further steps become unnecessary. Likewise, an effective conversation may preclude the need for allegations. Giving Voice to Values is the program developed by Mary C. Gentile with the support of the Aspen Institute and the Yale School of Management. Although it was initially designed for the business community, GVV has spread to medicine, law, and other fields. Because of the time limits, I'm only going to discuss the parts of giving voice to values which are most salient for addressing research misconduct. However, I encourage you all to read Mary Gentile's book, Giving Voice to Values, How to Speak Your Mind When You Know What is Right. This book is rooted in the premise that you want to act on your values and it prepares you to respond to values conflicts with integrity. I've found this program immensely useful in many circumstances, both professional and personal, and I believe you will as well. So the first strategy is collecting all the facts because a careful, open-minded exploration may show that what you thought was misconduct was really only the result of misunderstanding, miscommunication, or an honest mistake. A few minutes ago, I mentioned the three different levels of definitions of misconduct. So you'll want to refer to them as you try to determine if the research community considers the suspected behavior a serious breach of integrity. Although the NSF definition delineates fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism, an institution may expand this definition to include other forms of malfeasance. At the same time, each discipline has its own standards and practices. Behavior that looks suspicious may in fact be acceptable. And even when a behavior unquestionably violates codes, it may be thought trivial. For example, journal editors may disregard plagiarism in the methods section, but investigate word-for-word -word copying of another author's work in other sections of a research article. You must determine if a behavior represents misconduct and if administrators and fellow researchers will agree that it is significant. If the behavior meets these two criteria, the next step is assembling evidence. In the event that formal allegations become necessary, you must ensure that the evidence is sound and defensible. It's a good idea to document every step and every con conversation from the moment you first detect or suspect misconduct. Now here, I need to acknowledge the challenge of providing evidence. In fact, in a recent survey, researchers in Switzerland cited this difficulty as a deterrent to raising questions. So now we come to the second strategy. If you have reasonable grounds for suspecting misconduct, the time has come to speak with the persons involved. In the best-selling book, Difficult Conversations, Douglas Stone, Bruce Patton, and Sheila Heen urge readers to initiate a learning conversation by listening, posing open-ended questions, and seeking concrete information. Notably, in the Swiss survey I just mentioned, respondents recommended a friendly conversation and a polite query as a way of dealing with misconduct. In the same way, Mary Gentile recommends posing questions and allowing other views of the situation instead of launching accusations. 
Now, during the conversation, you should expect to hear rationalizations. I've listed here the most common justifications for unethical behavior and some possible counter arguments that you can use. Sometimes you will hear the rationalization, everyone does it. But in fact, you can counter this rationalization by providing examples of others who have made the right choices in similar situations. Don't assume that everyone behaves badly. For the rationalization, no one's going to get hurt you can respond with the counter argument that some things are just wrong, even if they appear to do no material harm. For the rationalization, I'm following orders, a good response is asking if we can take responsibility for making sure that the right thing gets done. And finally, for the rationalization, I need to look out for my team or my company, you can respond with the question, to whom do we want to be loyal? And what about looking out for that person or that group's best interest in the long run? These counter arguments draw upon core values shared by cultures around the world. But researchers in all disciplines are socialized in the core values of research, honesty, fairness, openness, accountability, objectivity, and stewardship. During a conversation about suspected misconduct, you can also point to the greater purpose of the research enterprise, the pursuit of immediate goals like grants, publications, and high status positions may divert attention from the more significant ones. Science, as the National Academies asserts, aspires to produce benefits to society in the form of better health, enhanced understanding of the natural world, and new technologies that boost economic growth and improve life in myriad ways. Clearly, misconduct stands at odds with this aspiration. So now we come to the final strategy. If an amiable conversation fails to resolve concerns about misconduct, a formal allegation may be the only recourse. It is true that, at some institutions, individuals who submit allegations may risk job loss, denial of promotion, or other forms of retaliation. At the same time, you want to consider the, re the costs of failing to report misconduct. A few minutes ago, we discussed the detrimental consequences, so I'm not going to repeat them now. I will only reiterate that the failure to confront misconduct may imperil the welfare of individuals, such as research subjects and future patients, as well as public safety. At the very least, later revelations of misconduct may damage the reputation of the discipline, of the institution, and of every member of the research team. You know, I keep thinking, if only someone at Duke had spoken up. Despite the image conjured by the term whistleblowing, reporting misconduct will not necessarily result in public shaming or media spectacles. Importantly, it does not mean rushing into the chancellor's office. Institutions that receive federal funding have policies specifying to whom one should report misconduct and how the administration will handle allegations. Following the proper procedures demonstrates that you are acting in good faith and obligates the administration to acknowledge the allegations. C.K. Gonzalez, who is a licensed attorney and university professor, as well as director of the National Center for Professional and Research Ethics, offered the following advice. First, identify the individuals or organizations responsible for oversight of the researcher suspected of misconduct. Become familiar with the procedure for submitting allegations and the process for reviewing them. Present the allegations as factual statements and provide documentation. You want to avoid vindictive language and speculation about motives. Be prepared to testify before a committee. And as a final point, Gonzalez con counsels patients because the process always takes longer than will feel reasonable. So, okay. I apologize that my interactive slides are not functioning very well. So we'll have to skip that one as well. I apologize. Typically, the university's procedures for reporting misconduct can be traced from the Office of Research website. 
Again, I'm using the example of Harvard University. So this institutional policy, which must include particular elements stipulated by federal laws, also outlines procedures for responding to and investigating allegations. After this webinar, please take some time to find the institutional policy for the place where you work and read it. You want to be prepared in advance for a situation. Okay. So researchers against whom allegations are made also merit protection, and they should be presumed innocent until wrongdoing is confirmed. Penalties for convicted researchers using NSF funds range from a written reprimand to suspension or termination of an award to criminal prosecution. Public disclosure of misconduct is a significant penalty. Why? Because disclosure exposes researchers to informal sanctions levied by the research community, such as a decline in reputation and in citations to their publications. If you're interested in examples of misconduct cases and the penalties which were imposed, you might want to look at the NSF OIG website. OIG stands for Office of the Inspector General. You might also take a look at the cases reported by the ORI, which is the Office of Research Integrity hosted by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Again, this is where you would go to find information about misconduct for cases using NIH funding. And now we come to the conclusion. When we participate in research, we share the responsibility to promote integrity. But carrying out this responsibility requires preparation. As a first step, we need to understand the definitions of misconduct, its incidents, and its common causes. We also need a strategy for responding when we detect or suspect misconduct. An awareness of misconduct should give, make us more attentive and simultaneously more sympathetic toward researchers working in a hyper-competitive, resource-scarce environment. In closing, I want to return to the Giving Voice to Values program. While acknowledging that promoting integrity requires moral courage, GVV asserts that anyone can develop moral competence. One great way to prepare to act as an agent of integrity is to build a support network. And fortunately, we have access to colleagues and mentors within our own community. The time has come to prepare for the responsibility of promoting research integrity. So let's start the conversation. Again, I am Melody Herr and I work here at the University of Arkansas. The presentation I just gave you was drawn in part from an article which I recently published in Science and Technology Libraries. There's the citation. And I want to thank Jessica Kelly for helping to design the visuals for this presentation. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to exit out and stop sharing. Back to you, Brian. Great. Uh, thank you, Melody, for a fantastic presentation. Um, we're now going to open it up to questions. Uh, so I'm going to give people a few minutes to ask any questions they might have into the chat box. If you have a question that deals with a, uh, with a particular situation, especially if it's a real life situation, um, we ask that you do not use any specific names of people or institutions. Um, I'll just go ahead and kick us off. Uh, Melody, you mentioned the number of, of books and resources uh, during your presentation. Do you, have, uh, do you have a live guide or, or a resource list that we'd be able to share with people later or a link that we'd be able to share? Right. The the final page of the slides, which I submitted to you a day or two ago, contains a list. Also, please look at the bibliography in the article, which I mentioned. Great. 
So um, as, as we wait for questions, uh, questions or any comments that people may have, I think there was a lot of, uh, you know, you, you talked about, um, you know, the different types of conversations or, or common rationalizations and counter arguments that, that, uh, that people have. Um, can you tell us uh, a little bit more um, about the types of conversations that, um, that, 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 that you've had that you've had with, uh, with faculty or researchers at your institution? Um, yes, and most of them focus on the factors that James Dubois and his team pointed out. It's not that people are doing things they shouldn't be. They're not making up data. They're not falsifying their data. What is happening is everyone knows how stressed faculty are. There are always more students to teach. Um, more classes, more papers to grade, more research grants to write. And so what happens um, is things slip. There are too many projects going on. People are not aware of regulation. They're not supervising their graduate students as closely as they would like to. Um, and so when I'm having conversations, with people in general, not specifically about a particular incident. It's always, we're afraid things are going to go awry because we can't pay attention and we have too much going on. And so I don't know how to fix that other than everyone needs to be more attentive and maybe we as institutions should be thinking about how much, how much pressure we put on our researchers. I'd love to hear other people's ideas on how to approach that problem. Great. Um, okay, so we have one question that just came in. What is the difference between fabrication and falsification? Fabrication is making things up out of thin air. Falsification is changing the data that you've already collected. Um, another comment uh, says, as a graduate student, I appreciate your empathetic approach to addressing misconduct. You are welcome. It doesn't help at all to launch into a conversation at, um, with accusations. Uh, that, that, actually, uh, that, that actually sort of brings up an interesting thing as people are continuing to think of questions and comments. Um, I've served before on an academic misconduct committee and that dealt more with students and trying to teach students, um, you know, proper research and something that we found, you know, sort of working with the Writing Center, that it wasn't necessarily a case of uh, misconduct being intentional, but it could be a cultural difference if they were international students, yes. or just a misunderstanding of how research and writing is done. Um, do, do you do any work uh, in the instruction of students or working with faculty to improve how they teach, um, how they research? Yes, there was, before I arrived at Arkansas, there was some real concern about international graduate students. And so we had a li the engineering librarian here made a real effort to create a program designed specifically for graduate students explaining what copyright is and what constitutes plagiarism. So that made a real difference on our campus. It would be interesting to hear from the participants what kinds of training librarians are helping to provide with regard to plagiarism or um, other forms of research misconduct? You know, how can we get involved? How can we help? Okay, so speaking of copyright, we have another question here, and I think that, I think this is often um, this is this is something that I, I have a difficulty articulating too. Sometimes, uh, do copyright violations fall under plagiarism, or is it not related to this discussion on misconduct? According to the federal definitions, plagiarism is copying materials. Um, I'm sure there are other forms of copyright violations which are not considered plagiarism. Great, and another question. What are different types of research that are most subject to research misconduct, for example, grant writing? I honestly don't have an answer to that question, but it's a good one. Do any of the participants have insights on that question? Uh, 
Uh, so someone commented, uh, definitely working to increase awareness of copyright issues through the library. Um, a question that we have is, could you talk a moment about predatory journals? If an article submits an article to a journal knowing that it will be accepted without minimal or no peer review, does that constitute misconduct? Wow, that's a fabulous question. I have not seen any institutions who have officially made that misconduct. It would be really interesting to have that conversation. Again, misconduct there is always very tightly defined, and there's a reason for that. Um, otherwise, let's see, I'm talking myself into a hole. If you're going to accuse someone of misconduct or even have a conversation with them and say, I think what you're doing is wrong, before you can use the label conduct, you better have a definition behind you, whether it's at the federal level or the institutional level or in the discipline. And if you spend some time looking at like the ethics codes collection that I showed you or the websites for professional societies, they list a number of things that they consider unethical or unacceptable, which aren't exactly misconduct. And it's important to keep, to keep that separate. There's a term called detrimental practices or practices that are detrimental to research. And that's sort of a big basket that includes everything that is discouraged but doesn't meet that very tight definition of misconduct. Does that help? Hello, Brian. Uh, hello. Yeah, I'm. You know, uh, I'm just. I'm just seeing if this person is re is responding. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, you've talked a lot about lost strategies for having conversations, um, and you know there are a number of uh, librarians on this call, and there are also other professionals are on that are on this call. Um, do you think these strategies are effective no matter what role they play in their institutions? Yes. And that's one of the things that I loved so much about the Giving Voice to Values program because Mary Gentile makes clear that whatever your status, whatever your role is, you can make a difference in promoting integrity. And so just because your job is data entry or just because you're a graduate student, doesn't mean that you can't, um, you can't speak up. But Mary Gentile also points out the importance of having allies. And that doesn't mean gossiping with all of your fellow graduate students and trying to build a coalition that way, but rather finding another mentor, someone who maybe has a higher status position and just saying, hey, can we talk about the things I'm seeing? I'm not sure if I should be concerned or not, what should I do? And if you can get that more senior person on board, um, you can really be effective. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on. Um, if anyone has any other questions, uh, please feel free to continue put, putting them into the chat box or, um, or you know, go ahead and email us and we'll pass any questions uh, we have on, on to Melody. Uh, I don't want to volunteer her to take your questions over email. Um, Melody, would you be willing to answer questions if people have any further questions after this? Absolutely, absolutely. I care passionately about this topic. And so um, please feel free to reach out to me. You have my contact information and I'd, I'd love to chat. Great, well thank you again for coming. It was a pleasure having you with us. Okay, have a good day to everyone.